Hello and welcome to Infinity. I'm Charlie Serafin. We've done many programs on the mind and the spirit. This time we're going to be talking about the body. Our guests are Marion Rosen and Mary Kay Wright Miller. Marion Rosen is a pioneer in the field of body work. She began her studies in Germany in the 1930s where she started to learn her method of breath and touch. She's lived in the United States since 1940 and has taught her methods in many parts of the world. Mary Kay Wright Miller is a return guest to Infinity. She's the director of the graduate program of parapsychological studies at John F. Kennedy University. But she's been studying with Marion Rosen for five years and is a practitioner of the Rosen method. People hear a lot of talk about the mind and body connection. Can we talk about that connection? What is the connection? How does working with the body help the mind? I wouldn't know how it would help the mind, but the mind, or the, I would rather say the emotions, uh, apparently have a lot to do with the formation of the body. What I do is work on the body, but what we reach is the emotions. Is it a, a stabilizing kind of thing that you're able to do or, or a release? In the end, I think it is both. Mostly it's an awareness process that takes place. Is it, there's so much emphasis in our society today on exercise and conditioning and eating right and, and taking care of your body and your health. I think there's a new resurgence of the, of the health movement in the United States. And they say a healthy body and a healthy mind, they go hand in hand. Is, is your method one of those, uh, one of the manifestations of that kind of movement? It's absolutely so that the mind and the and I would like to say the emotions, mm -hmm. too, are what forms the body, and that a healthy, a healthy emotional system, an unrepressed emotional system, would certainly help the body to function. And this is what happens all the time in our work. Mary Kay, we decided we before at. we went on the air that we would ask you to define what the Rosen method is, and maybe you can do that for us. Well, my understanding of the Rosen method of body work is that it's an approach that's um, a hands-on methodology. People actually are touching the body of the client in a very gentle way that m looks a little bit like massage, but is not massage at all because the effect is much, much deeper. And it's a combination of um, working with verbal material processing simultaneously with relaxing the body of the client. And what happens as tightly held muscles or tension areas start to let go of what we call muscular holding, the issues or dilemmas or um, unconscious processes that, in a sense, are behind the holding start to come into the consciousness and awareness of the person who's being worked on so that they start to have a sense of what it is that's going on in their life, whether it's present day or historical things that have happened in the past that have had an impact on how they function and how the musculature in their body is patterned with tension. And so what they get not only is relaxation but a much deeper awareness of aspects of their being. Marion, when you work with someone, when a, a, a patient or a client or what do you call the subject of your work? Client. A client. Yeah. When a client comes in, do you, when you look at that person, do you look at them emotionally first and then decide what kind of a physical approach you'll take or do you look at them physically first and work on the physical and then think you understand more about their emotions? Yes, I look at them physically first because I feel that the body is the picture or the expression of their emotional state. That the tensions that are there are emotions that have been either repressed or held back. And so it is like, you know, like seeing seeing the whole person through the body. And what do you do then if someone were to come to you and and let's take a, uh, an example of it's a uh, business person and they mm -hmm. operate in a very stressful environment yeah. and 
and they are experiencing some physical discomfort that they believe might be associated with that, um, maybe some back pain, which would be, a, I would think, a common thing. And they come to you and say, I've got this back pain, I've got this job, and it gives me headaches, and I'm, I'm all uptight, and what can you do for me? Yeah. Where do you begin? I put them down on the table. They have to take their shirt off, or anyway, I like to put my hands on their body to feel for what what state the body is in. And I run my hands over them to feel how the body how the body uh, manifests into my hands, which means is there tension, is there easy movement in the muscle? And then also where does the breath go in the body? And that is one of my very important parts to use the breath somehow as a monitor. When you are relaxed, the areas that are relaxed will be moved by our breathing. The areas that are being in tension, that are being held, are not moved by the breathing. So I can see something with my eyes, and I can feel something with my hands. My hands will go to the places that are moving the least, that are the hardest, that hold action, that hold tension without letting go of the tension, without letting go of the action. And you want to know more about yeah, it? Yeah, let's like go to back to yeah. the specific example of this individual who yeah. has, let's say, a back problem. Now, okay. as you feel their back, you took their, sh their shirt off, yes, you're feeling you feel their, their back. back, you can feel some tension I there. feel some tension. I feel some tension on the places that they said was sore. But then I also go to other places to see, because very often the part that hurts is not the part that they hold tense. It is at the effect of the other places that they hold tense. And so I will feel for all the places in the body that are being held. That means they do not, when they lie on the table, give up their work. When you lie on a table, you don't need to work. So if a person lies down and holds their head pulled into their body, or the shoulders pulled up to the ears or put together, I know they do work that they don't need to do. So something else is going on than just um, normally what the body would do normally. Mm -hmm. So I address myself to these areas and put my hands there, and then I work. I give, as you said, it's not a massage. It is like a massage, you know, to try to work the muscles so they feel that they are holding, that there's something in the muscles that is not necessary to do or to be. So people are getting aware what is going on there. At the same time, I'm looking what happens with their breath. Yeah. When, you, when you do this, then, it, a massage, it seems to me, the difference would be that in a massage, you have someone who helps release the tension from those muscles because of the physical pressure that they're putting right. on them or the way that they're manipulating yeah. the muscles. But when you stand up from the massage, it may last for 15, 20 minutes or an hour yeah. or whatnot. Obviously, your work is designed to have much longer Longer impact. reaching mm -hmm. and a much deeper impact. We have learned also to see what kind of movement does this particular tension inhibit, you know. When we have, for instance, somebody with a very tight neck, what would it inhibit? What would it say you know, to see about it? First of all, of course, it won't let you move your head. So very e easily you hold your head on in one position mm -hmm. and don't allow yourself to look any other places. So you will mention something of that kind. And this goes now into our verbal word already, that we will, as we um, explore the body, that we will also say what we feel and what we say what happens. And we have muscles on our, on our neck that very often, you know, we use when we are angry, when we can't yell, you know, when we hold it in, or when we get sad very often, and we don't want to show that. And we hold our, our sadness back, we hold our tears back. And as we work on these areas, you know, we can just mention that these muscles are there usually to suppress certain certain emotions that come into the body. And 
then go on to work on them. I always work then on specifically on the places where the complaint was about. If, for instance, somebody says, I have a sore neck, I would not totally work on the low back where I feel a lot of tension because the support is not there for the neck. I would work on the neck. But I would also mention that this neck has to be very tight if there's no support from the, from the lower side, mm -hmm. you know, to hold up the back. That if you are, are willing to use the support that you have in your lower back area, that then the neck has a different way of functioning and way of being. This is just in reference to how we go about it. Mm -hmm. Then would then you encourage this person that leaves uh, a session after you've uh, talked about some of these things to uh, move their neck more, to, to consciously try to move their head, or are there any specific <laughs> exercises or anything that you... Not would really. What I want at first is get them in touch that they are holding. Also, that it's not something somebody is doing it to them. It's not a, a stiff neck. It is a neck that you hold, which I think is a great difference when they know I can do something about it. Something is going on in me that has an influence on what is going on with my body. And once they connect there, things happen by themselves. Sometimes as we work, emotions are coming up just as the repressive mechanism lessens. You know, as the breath comes up more, as the muscles repress less of the material that people needed for some reason to not let come up. And so they all of a sudden say, I feel sad, or they start to cry, or they say, this is something, you know, I feel very soft, or what, whatever goes on with them. Mm -hmm. and so during your sessions, quite normally, people do release a lot of emotions as they're as their muscles and tension and everything is, is loosened I up. will not say they release, but they get in touch very often with emotions and do not know what is happening with them. Because very often it is not current stuff that goes on. Mm -hmm. It's just current experiences are enhancing whatever they are holding already. So what we are getting in touch with our experiences, our ways of holding yourself, our ways of being that reach much further back than just the present time. Also, one doesn't necessarily go through an emotional release in a session. What I find many times with people I'm working on, they go into very deeply relaxed states. And it may be that no conscious connection happens, but something shifts and changes anyway because the unconscious is working within the body and so connections and releases can happen that the person never quite has pinpointed and that's fine because the healing process still occurs. We talked about breath a little bit. Let's get into that. You said that if if the muscles are relaxed that the breath, you can see the breath there and we normally associate breath with maybe the nose, you could see someone breathing through, through their nose, or the mouth, or the face, the chest perhaps, that's where the lungs are, but we don't really think of, uh, for example, seeing breath in the back, I don't, in, in off the top of my head, or in someone's arms, or in someone's legs, or something like that. Do you see breath in all those different parts of the body? We do. We have a very lovely movie of a baby lying on its stomach, and the baby lying on its back. But when we come into this world, and when we are little, and don't have many tensions yet, many emotions that we have to repress, the breath goes into the butt just as much as it goes into the chest or into the neck. You see the movement of the breath going all the way through the body. And when they lie on their back, it's just the same. That it's not just the chest that is being moved but there's a lot of movement where the diaphragm moves in the middle of the body. And you see, see the movement into the hip joint and beyond. And you feel the movement when you have your hand on the leg. You can feel the breath movement. If you were to pick an average, could we do that to say uh, if we took 100 people off the street from all different walks of life, 
um, different ages and different occupations, everything different about them, a hundred people. How many people have repressed breath or repressed breathing now? How many people really breathe naturally as they did as babies? I, I couldn't tell you that because people come to me when they have some kind of repression. But even if I look on the street, there's maybe 10, 15 percent who don't repress, you know, who have handled things or who do not hold back or come from cultures maybe that do not make it necessary to repress emotions in the way that the Anglo-Saxon culture does. Also, the Scandinavian cultures we were teaching there, and we found the same picture. I have not worked in South America or in places where emotions are more accepted than they are with us. Do you think it has something to do with your background? And this may be a total stereotype, but I'll throw it out. I always have the opportunity to ask one dumb question on the program every week, and this is nice. it. Nice. You, you have a, a German background. Yes. Many times we think of the Germanic peoples as being a very stiff, upright, strong um, people that are not very emotional. Do you think that that has some, that it, it brought you to the attraction for this kind of system to sit here and talk about Absolutely. Emotions? Absolutely. I had asthma as a child. And so people said, you better learn how to breathe and found out, you know, as I learned this work uh, at the time that it was a repressive state that had caused the asthma you know, and had come into it. And it is very much so. How do you teach people to breathe? Do you teach I them don't through, through... I don't teach them. I'm sorry. Okay. How do, you, um, how do you help people change their breathing habits? Through their experience. Only through their experience, getting in touch with what they repress. Because the normal being is very, is very fine for us. We know who we are. We know how we function. If we take away our, our repression, if we take our non-functioning, our holding back, and you can see that again and again when people get in touch with it, when they change their patterns, when they go back the way they were meant to be, that their pain goes away, their body starts to function in a different way, and you do not need to teach it. How do people find, you mentioned earlier that oftentimes the, the tensions that are there, the experiences that are stored in the body aren't something from yesterday or even last week. They can be from from years earlier, there's no real time reference necessarily with these stored feelings. Do you talk them through these situations as you notice something? As they come up, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you have someone that has tension in their neck again, yeah. let's go back because you used okay. that example. That. And you're trying to uh, help them get in touch with their emotions so that they can release those tensions in their neck. Do you talk to them about experiences they might have had consciously to to uh, try to make them recollect something that happened when they were a child or, or some other experience? Uh, the way we go about it, it's very general. You know, all we say is that we have experiences in our childhood where we, you know, have, that we cannot handle, that we have to hold back, that are either frightening or they're going on long range. But we do not say, you have that, but we say also, that some of these experiences, for instance, not crying, are movements here that we store in our neck, you know, that we hold back, that we are being told not to cry, especially boys. That the culture says it's not right for boys to cry. And just talk about that in a general way. And if it means something to the person, the person's breath will react. And as the breath reacts, you know, then we will maybe talk a little bit more about how hard it is, you know, when people have. And then very often they either get in touch with it, they will say something, or sometimes they don't even say anything, but their breathing pattern will change. And then we know that they have connected. Sometimes we tell them that we feel they have connected to something. Sometimes we don't even tell them that. We just store it in our, mm -hmm. in our knowledge. But something happens, maybe I would like to say, to them afterwards. Like when I was teaching last year in Sweden, I heard there was a 
zoology professor who was very interested, you know, but very abstract. But on his way home from a six-day workshop, he started to cry and couldn't stop crying. And he had the hardest time asking for the gas station and explained to the man that he was crying because he had a massage, you know, <laughs> and didn't really know what had happened to him. Uh -huh. But slowly, after a week or two, all of a sudden, some of the experiences, some of the ways of being became conscious to him. So we had really nothing straight to do with what happened to him, except that we touched the areas where he was holding and talked about what goes into holding a special area. Mary Kay, maybe you could mm -hmm. give us another specific example of an individual that you might have worked with that, that exhibited some sort of, of uh, release so that you could tell that what you're doing is working. Well, it happens all the time. I'm, I'm trying to think of a specific example. What flashed in my mind was a, a man that I've worked with real consistently over a period of time. And um, many, many times when I worked with him, he would become very relaxed and there would be changes in the body and we'd feel like we had a very nice session, but there wasn't any particular point that was coming through um, or realization and then one day we were working and I just had this intuitive hit to ask um, how did your heart break as a child or something like that what, what happened when you were a child what broke your heart as a child and this wave of energy passed through him and um, a lot of emotional things came up and what happened was he got in touch with um, being somewhere between four and six, seven years old, and realizing that he felt totally spiritually abandoned, that he just did not have any sense of connection to the world or the universe or his family or anything, and that that had been pushed way, way, way back, but it had been affecting him the whole rest of his life up until that moment when he had that realization. And one of the things that I want to say about the work that hasn't really been directly brought up in the conversation so far is that my personal point of view is that this is a forum that does touch on spiritual issues in people. It's not necessarily the intention to do that or we don't set ourselves up as spiritual teachers or guides or anything like that, but when one really starts to work with the core and the inner life of someone, that their own relationship with the deepest parts of themselves will, will process at times. and. For me, that's a very profound um, gift or opportunity to be with somebody when they're going through a process like that, and I want to acknowledge that about the work. Marion, you know, a lot of mystics would say that we are not the body, but we only live within the body, that, our, that we are the spirit, and the spirit uh, resides within this tabernacle or, yes. or whatever. There's a lot of different we languages used. We are not the body. But the body is, is mirroring, is expressing who we are. And that is very definitely so. But I also wanted to say that with the awareness, of course, there's a transformation going on. A transformation in the body, a transformation of the attitude, a transformation of the, of the consciousness. So that happens. So we don't always say that. We say it that the people lose their pain, like this professor lost some very severe shoulder pains that he came in with. And that was important to him, but the other things were much more important. And we only are at the beginning of experiencing what's going on about that. Would you say that most physical pain is associated with some kind of an emotional trauma? I would say yes. Mm -hmm. I think so. One of the things that we just touched on before we... Uh, began the interview formally was as a subject and you said you don't deal with it a lot but uh, physical injuries um, those also uh, cause pain and, and are oftentimes not emotionally related if you're in a car accident or something like that it may have some kind of an emotional base maybe you were disturbed and you weren't driving very well and you had an accident but something uh, uh, you walk through the forest and a tree fell on your arm and broke it or your leg or something like that is there a stored sort of feeling? Are there emotions that are stored in those kinds of physical injuries that you work with as well? There are emotions, of course, of fear, you know, of fear of the unexpected, you know, of the fear of being attacked in a way. 
and not not being ready for it. And this is really the hardest thing in a car accident when we treat people afterwards to overcome that. That the injuries itself will heal. But the apprehension, you know, this holding takes much longer to get rid of. So this is quite a point. But also people sometimes forget, you know, they've been in a cast and afterwards walk with somebody like that with a totally normal leg and was still walking as if he had a cast on. And all it took was to say, you know, you don't have the cast on anymore. And the pain went away because, or the limp went away at that camp because he'd forgotten that he didn't have that. So some of these things are very true. There are a lot of different people right now trying a, a, a myriad of approaches to try to get to this mind-body relationship that we're talking about. Yes. What do you think about physical exercise? The um, I mentioned something earlier. I said, okay, I'll just keep doing my push-ups and my pull-ups kind of thing. That kind of strenuous physical exercise, um, running, lifting weights, and, and that sort of thing. If you want to be an athlete, that is fine. But I think the most important thing is that you have your your body in working condition. When you have a good car, a really good car, you don't want to rev it up and go 100 miles an hour all the time. But you want to know that if you need to go fast, you can go fast. And if you just need to idle, you can idle. And what I think the exercises are for is to oil your joints, to expand your chest, to have all your muscles at your disposal, not half contracted with tension, but free and relaxed. So if you want to move them, they can move. So your whole body is really there to serve you. And that this is what we're working for. You would encourage then more stretching exercises, stretching, kind of yoga, uh, a yogic approach. Dancing, mm -hmm. moving, wiggling, just any kind of movement during the day. And whatever you do, do it fully. You know, Do it with joy and do it with ease. Come to the point of ease with your body and enjoyment, well-being. Do yeah. people relax, let go, loosen up as they age or do they tighten up? It depends who you are. You become more who you are anyway. I have people in my exercise class. I give some exercise classes to who are over 80. Some have done it for 25 years and are in terrific condition. One started a year ago and lost a terrible neck condition that none of the doctors could touch both over 80, you know, and move. Each moves in their own way. Some young people can hardly move. You know, you can wonder how they get around. And some are wonderful. So it doesn't have to do with age so much as it has to do how, how you're treating yourself. What about diet? Is that a big part of, of it? I do not use diet, but I believe in it. And not really in dieting, but in eating how it's, supports you. You live here in the Bay Area, and the Bay Area, generally speaking, has clean air. The fog comes in and, and does a natural bathing sort of thing, but it isn't always clean. Um, the people who live in Southern California, generally speaking, since breath is so important to what you're talking about, how important is the quality of air? To the Very important. I, I can feel it when I go up to the mountains in um, about an hour and a half out of town. The feeling is totally different of energy, you know, wanting to move, wanting to do things. So I still think even so it's a fairly good area. It is not as good as it ought to be. And I think that is something really people should look into. Ideally, you'd want to live on the mountaintop then with the, yes. with the spiritual sages. A little boring, but then <laughs> fine. In some forms of meditation, people often try to transcend body consciousness. Is that a is that a bad thing? You know, what you're talking about in this work is really getting in touch it's with the body it's and being in the body, honing in. Is there what is, what is the well variance? I, I would of never of put a good bad on anything okay, like well a meditation I'll practice. Okay. So I'll just say that up front. Um, I think that those practices serve a particular um way of being or a particular path of conscious evolution and they've been developed for thousands and thousands of years in various cultures